A reckless Italian boy committed the largest robbery in the world, puzzled the police, and involved them in a cat and mouse game over many years of theft that made him a rich man and a professional thief whom the police failed to reach and reveal his identity. So, who is this boy? What are the most prominent thefts that he committed? How did he manage to stay under the police's radar? This is what we are going to find out in the coming minutes of today's video. On January 16, 1972, a 17-year-old boy named Valerio Fitch had just started his criminal career with great fanfare when, on that date, he helped one of his comrades blow up a TV station tower in his hometown of Ascoli Passino in North Italy. Fitch was just another good boy who took the wrong path to turn bad, but no one knew how bad he could get. Both his father and brother were lawyers, while his mother ran a clothing store, and the family was resigned to the idea that Fitch was a spoiled brat who could never be fixed. By the day after that incident, Fitch was arrested at the family house after it was confirmed that he had participated in the blow-up. As for the prison, Fitch considered his sentence there as an educational period, where he made many friends among fraudsters and thieves, and benefited from their experiences. He turned from a beginner and inexperienced boy in life to a criminal fascinated by the world of crime, especially the field of theft and robbery, which soon became his job. As soon as he was released, Fitch had enough audacity and courage to steal at that early age. He started stealing as he went on to rob post offices in the nearby villages. According to Detective Geordie James, Fitch's audacity made him famous quickly. Fitch had a clever plan to walk into the post office with a gun and a newspaper. When he approaches the employee near the counter, he points the weapon at him and covers him with a newspaper so that the rest of the people don't notice. When the employee surrenders and hands him all the money, he rushes out to find his friend waiting for him on a motorcycle, and they both flee the scene. Unfortunately for him, fame has a bad side, as Fitch soon finds himself back in prison again. While he was waiting for his sentence to be issued, he invested the time and continued his education with the top criminals there, and by the time he reached his late twenties, he had become a professional criminal. Returning to the town in which he used to live, Fitch found himself on the list of the most dangerous criminals. Each time a robbery happened in town, he was immediately suspected, and the police came to his house to interrogate him, looking for any evidence that could link him to the crime and prove his involvement. Fitch stopped his theft operations because of the constant police pressure. He was sure that the Italian authorities would not stop hunting him. Consequently, Fitch decided that it would be in his best interest to cease all his criminal activities and leave the country. He first traveled to Switzerland and opened a bank account there, away from the eyes of the police. He also used fake passports without getting arrested. Eventually, he settled in London, where he had some friends. At first, he did not speak English. He was not even able to ask for a cup of coffee. But due to his intelligence, he was able to study and learn the language quickly. Fitch remained conservative and discreet for a long time in London before resuming the robberies. He needed time to carefully examine all the potential targets for theft, including banks, jewelry stores. During his first year in London, Fitch managed to rob five British banks. His own technique of robbing and the fact that the bank security guards were not armed as in Italy were both factors that enabled him to get in and out of the bank quickly. Fitch became a wealthy man and lived a good life in one of the fanciest neighborhoods in London called John Wood Street. He was pretending to be an Italian journalist coming to learn English and everyone assumed he belonged to a rich family. Fitch was thinking about expanding his criminal activities by targeting places where he could get more money. There was a depository center at Knightsbridge full of treasures. It was a center that contained thousands of safe deposit boxes in which people used to save their valuable items. He began planning for the depository center to be his next target. The center was located in one of the most prestigious neighborhoods in London, and the deposit boxes were in the basement and protected by the latest protection systems. Fitch knew that there would be several problems if he wanted to carry out his operation, as the locks worked automatically, 
and there were two walls of thick bulletproof glass and video surveillance. Fitch realized that his traditional method would not work in such a facility. He couldn't rob the center the way he used to rob post offices. Things were more complicated this time, so he decided to follow another plan. At first, Fitch changed his appearance to show people that he was a successful businessman, and he began to come to the center permanently to put his deposits. At each visit, he used the time he spent inside the center to study the place and know all the details that could help him implement his plan, so much so that he formed a friendship with the center's manager. Latif, one day Fitch was at dinner with the center's manager and his girlfriend, Flavia, and he discovered that his girlfriend could help him. So he decided to get close to her and go out with her so that he could get some information. And over time, the owner's girlfriend revealed to him that Latif was experiencing financial difficulties. After gathering all that data, Fitch was able to create the plan, which required him to carefully consider countless small details. He concluded that he needed powerful tools to break the safe boxes as well as a safe house to store all of the loot. He also knew that he should get in and out quickly. He should enter the basement and break all the safe boxes before the security guards came at 5.30. To achieve this goal, Fitch recruited a team of crooks who could accept a small amount of money in return for their help because he wanted to keep the money for himself alone. Fitch had the plan and the assistance. What was missing at that time was choosing the right day to start the robbery that would immortalize his name as one of the most famous thieves in the world. That was the promised day, July 12, 1987, when Fitch and one of his assistants, dressed in formal suits, entered the depository center and introduced him to his friend Latif as a new client. Latif was very happy to receive a new client, and he appointed one of the employees to take Fitch and his friend on a tour of the center and to tell them about the strength of the center's security system. So the employee led them to secret rooms in the basement, and that was the only place that didn't have cameras. Fitch pulled out his gun and aimed it at the employee, threatening to kill him if he did not do what he was ordered to do. Then, accompanied by the employee, he went to the warehouse, where the employee asked the guard there to inform the guests about the security features of the warehouse. After they entered the room, Fitch pointed his gun at the guard as well, then tied him up. And despite that, there was still one more person, the security guard. Fitch threatened the first employee, then took him to his office and forced him to call the guard and ask him to bring some papers. And quickly, the three waited for the guard to come. Within minutes, the guard arrived in the room and Fitch pinned him to the ground and handcuffed him. Fitch was now in full control of the situation, having successfully secured the office and everyone inside. He then called the remaining gang members via a talkie-talkie device, but they did not respond. So Fitch had to leave the first assistant in the building with the guards and the employee while he went out to call the rest of the gang. At four o'clock, Fitch and his gang set to work as they had only an hour to break through hundreds of boxes. Time was running out for the gang as they started using a huge hammer to break the boxes and take what they contained. The time has come and they need to get out of there quickly. They had only broken 120 of the 5,000 boxes that were there. While they were about to leave, Fitch noticed that his finger was bleeding, but he didn't pay attention to it, as he had a greater concern in mind to get out of there with all the money they were stealing. Then before leaving, he went to the office where a member of his gang was with the center employee and asked for help. What none of the gang members realized was that the employee was Latif, the manager of the center, who knew all the center's ins and outs. Fitch gave him some money and got him out. Then Fitch, accompanied by the rest of the gang, headed to fill their cars with bags full of money, and they ran away. By half past five, the security guard came and found the place empty. After searching for a bit, he found the workers tied up in one of the rooms, and then it was discovered that the center had been robbed. The police were informed, and one of the investigators came to interrogate the two employees, in addition to Latif, the manager of the center, who played his role professionally. What the investigators were not aware of is that Latif had arranged for new employees who had never seen Fitch enter the center. 
and they were the ones who witnessed the theft. Since they had never seen him before, they could not identify his identity. No one was able to provide any information relevant to the investigation, and Latif disabled the cameras and said that it was a glitch in the system. One of the investigators believed that someone on the inside was part of the robbery, either by participating in it or by giving information in exchange for money. And despite that, he could not identify him. The policemen were also unable to determine the stolen amount, but they stated that it was more than $2 million. There was no evidence but a small bloody fingerprint. The investigators knew they had to work quickly before the money disappeared and the criminal got away. What no one knew was that Valerio Fitch had already left the country. By the day after, the news of the theft of the depository center had spread all over the country, causing a wave of panic and fear among the center's clients. Many safe box owners were stunned and shocked as they waited outside the center, fearful that their life savings had been stolen. Each one was heard separately by the investigators in order to determine the stolen amount. This was the biggest robbery that happened at that time, as it is not easy to rob a deposit center in downtown Kingston. This was where famously wealthy people and some members of the royal family kept their savings. Every day, someone came out to declare that the stolen amount was greater. Within four days of investigation, the total stolen amount changed from $5 million to $40 million, divided among money, jewelry, and other valuable treasures. Among these treasures was a 22-carat diamond owned by the family that controls Mercedes-Benz, which was once valued at 5 million pounds. Although it was challenging to estimate the exact amount that was stolen, all newspapers and investigators agreed that this robbery was the biggest armed robbery in recent memory. Police investigators stepped up their efforts, and as time and the investigation went on, the investigators came to the conclusion that the gang had a secret partner within the center who helped them orchestrate the heist and make a clean getaway. Investigators then attempted to match the fingerprint found at the crime scene. Despite the search in all criminal records, its owner was not found, so they sent it to Interpol, whose data indicated the identity of the fingerprint holder as belonging to an Italian person named Valerio Fitch. The investigators continued the search about Fitch's life, and after discovering that he was a man with a reckless boy inside him who loved to play, their suspicions were confirmed about the existence of a person who helped him inside the center. They also anticipated that the source of the information would be female. During the search, the investigators found out that Fitch had a luxury car, a big house, and a lot of money. They realized that any girl working at the center might be instantly attracted to him. Fitch continued to play his game as the police searched every inch of Britain for the suspect. And one day he ordered an expensive sports car and came back to the country to pick it up. According to investigator Judy, Fitch had the opportunity to leave the country entirely. He could have left for Brazil and avoided being arrested, but instead he kept leaving and returning trying to provoke the police. Based on information provided by the Italian authorities, the British police have been keeping an eye on potential Fitch partners, but so far, nothing has materialized. So people have been hired to watch over Fitch. The aim of these watchmen is to identify and report any suspicious activity that may occur. A month later, a police officer saw Fitch walking out of one of London's most luxurious hotels, a warrant was immediately issued for his arrest while he awaited an export license to take his car to South America. During the investigation, Valerio Fitch admitted that Latif, the manager of the center, was the person who cooperated with him from the inside, which the police could not believe. Investigator Khan said that they could hardly be convinced that Latif was Fitch's assistant, and they wouldn't have believed him if he didn't confess to that as he was the last person the police could suspect because of the way he used to talk to the detectives. Latif admitted that one day Fitch came to him and said bluntly, I have an offer for you, which is that I will steal your depository center in exchange for sharing the loot. A few months before the robbery, Latif had increased his business insurance from $1 million to $3 million. This was a strong reason for helping Fitch in the robbery. 
Investigator Gould added that Fitch was aware that Latif's financial situation was deteriorating and complex, which made Latif's temptation easy. In the end, $10 million out of $60 million, consisting of gemstones, coins, and precious metals, were recovered. In December 1992, Latif was sentenced to 18 years in prison, while the rest of the gang members were arrested, imprisoned, and sentenced to different terms. While Valerio Fitch was sentenced to 22 years in prison, while in custody, Fitch also admitted that he carried out five other unsolved robberies in England. A total of 54 robberies were committed by Fitch in both Italy and England. During the investigation, one of the detectives asked Fitch what he would have done if he hadn't been arrested. Fitch responded that he would have gone to another place, opened a bank account, and robbed that bank. The detective realized that it was just a matter of time before Fitch carried out a new robbery. Fitch served four years of his sentence in England before being transferred to his native Italy to serve the remainder of his sentence. Despite his long criminal history, he was released there on the condition that he returned to the prison every day at night. He will also remain under surveillance, and if he commits another crime, even a small one, he will be detained and another term will be added to his current sentence. In the end, the British authorities were able to arrest the most dangerous thief in the world, who was able to carry out the largest robbery in history, from which he earned more than $60 million with his gang. And if it weren't for the fingerprint he left there, this would have been one of his many unsolved thefts over the years, until he admitted it himself. Here we come to the end of our story. If you like it, do not forget to like and subscribe and activate the bell button so that you can receive new videos. Bye.